Welcome to our webcast, Always on Growth, Finance and HR Challenges That Can Trip You Up at Home and Beyond, brought to you by CFO Publishing and by the sponsor of our webcast, Global Upside. I'm Joe Fleischer. I'll be your moderator. What I'd like to do is tell you about our very distinguished guests, and I will go through each of them, but just so you know, they are Jessica Lee, Vice President and Corporate Controller with Zillow, Rich Harrison, CFO with Glaucos Corporation, and Raghu Bargava, co-founder and CEO of Global Upside. And by way of background, Raghu Bargava, co-founder and CEO of Global Upside, oversees the corporate direction and strategy for Global Upside, which provides support throughout more than 90 countries with international expansion, finance, payroll, human resources, and staffing, serving clients that range from startups to large Fortune 500 companies. And he has held leadership positions with a number of organizations, including uh, Deloitte, and so we will be hearing his perspective very shortly. But I also want to say that we have the pleasure of hearing from some senior finance uh, executives as well. We'll also hear perspective from Jessica Lee. She is vice president and corporate controller with Zillow. And uh, if you're familiar with Zillow, it offers a portfolio of leading real estate and home-related brands available online and through Zillow's mobile apps. And in 2011, after Zillow's initial public offering, Jessica Lee took on the role of controller with Zillow, overseeing all accounting operations, including banking, tax, payroll, and stock administrative functions. And we're also going to hear perspective from Rich Harrison, CFO of Glaucos. And I've mentioned that he uh, is CFO with Glaucos. He's been in that role since January 2008. He's also served previously as the company's treasurer and secretary, or rather he has served as the company's treasurer and secretary since July 2014. He's also served as CFO of a number of medical companies, and he has held a variety of financial roles. Uh, including that of corporate controller, uh, again, with a number of companies. Now, at this stage, we are going to hear perspective from Raghu Bargava, uh, who, again, is co-founder and CEO of Global Upside, and then we'll hear additional uh, case studies and additional perspective from our fellow, from, uh, our fellow panelists. At this stage, it is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Raghu. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Hi, this is Raghu, and wanted to just uh, give you a perspective on as you are growing globally, the challenges and what uh, issues you may face, uh, whether it's on the accounting side or on the HR side. And as the first slide talks about, you know, location is extremely important, whether you're going overseas or expanding locally within the country, because availability of talent, uh, availability or customers. Uh, is, is extremely important because you don't want to go where you don't have either the talent or the customer base. Then, and, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on all of these, but uh, footprint is important, how many people you want to hire, what's their eventual goal and stuff, um, entity setup, how do you organize yourself in a foreign jurisdiction, um, and, and what activities are you going to conduct there, just sales, and mar sales or sales and marketing or GNA or things like that. How do you find the right talent? Hiring and employment law, obviously, this is extremely important because most jurisdictions are much more complicated than U.S. Tax and accounting support. Um, how do you manage your global uh, operations? Do you centralize or not? How do you uh, achieve what you're required to achieve? And you'll hear from two of the public company CF, uh, CFOs and controllers today, but uh, that's important, and obviously compliance because that's a big issue for um, not just for uh, uh, large public companies, but also for private companies because of issues like um, FCPA, the federal, uh, um, you know, for, for bribery and those kind of things where you have to be extremely careful in some of these foreign jurisdictions where that might be the norm, modus operandi. Moving on to the next slide, um, so where to? That's the first question you want to answer. Why are you going there and what are you going to achieve once you get there? So, because it's not just about hiring the first salesperson and stuff, but do you have enough of a customer base there that is able to support your cost of expansion into any particular country? Now, typically we see uh, American companies going over to Western Europe, 
the the economies look a little bit like us countries like uk speak the same language um, a lot of the business customs regulations are very similar so it makes life easier um, but there's obviously a whole world beyond western europe uh, whether you go to asia or africa or or and i'll talk about some of the countries uh, around my last slide but as you decide where you're going you also have to worry about what are you going to do there like sales which is generally the first hire but as you grow your operations you may expand into marketing so you can do some localized marketing um, from a language perspective from a local customs perspective obviously a lot of it depends on what your product is is it b2c is it b2b because that will play into your other activities many times companies are going overseas to find the r&d talent eastern europe is a very good target market in that respect for the moment where there's a lot of availability of um, very highly educated very competent uh, r&d talent engineers and so that drives a very different behavior than if you were looking at sales and marketing expansions also how do you expand into a new country uh, you have many options from representative office to branch to subsidiary and some of it depends on you know what you're trying to do there some of it depends on what are your long term plans so if you're trying to just explore a market uh from a, from a customer perspective and you're just testing it then maybe a rep office or something like that is is good enough but if you're going to hire people for doing your r&d as an example then establishing a subsidiary for sure is the right answer and also a little bit of it depends on uh if you're selling what is the requirements do you have to ship locally bill locally that kind of stuff are going to customers going to be used to buying from a us company even though some local sales guys selling to them and a lot of that also plays into those that decision making so once you have decided where you're going to go and how you're going to get set up next step is obviously how you're going to achieve your accounting requirements uh, obviously payroll is part of that and and um, so how do you accomplish that and 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 um, in that you you have to think about uh, other considerations like tax and tax comes in many forms vat being one of them but income taxes and there might be other taxes applicable to you depending on how you are importing exporting uh, customs duties things like that um, and and um, are you doing business within the EU or are you exporting from the US into EU and then shipping from there locally uh, things like that do matter and just like in any country in any jurisdiction there's obviously an in annual income tax requirement that you have to worry about part of that is also money movement so uh, yes uh, you can and should open a bank account locally but many times most times it is very hard to do that uh, because of what is known as KYC and UBO requirements uh, know your customer and ultimate beneficial ownership uh, in in whether you're a public company or a private company uh, a lot of times proving who owns the who's the ultimate owner of the company can become a pain point um we've had situations where some company did not want to one of our clients did not want to go into singapore because of all the kyc requirements they didn't want to go to their it's a private company they didn't want to go to their investors and get all that detail from them so these are things that you have to worry about um when when you are because how will you make payroll if you don't have a local bank account and there are options but uh, having a local bank account facilitates all of that and once you have your basic operations going you have to worry about planning for growth so are you going to stay with that one person or are you if you're building an r&d team how many people are you going to intend to hire what is your ramp up plan how are you going to manage those people and and what kind of uh, permanent establishment risk something like this is your local operations are creating in that country because today every con every government entity in the world is strapped for cash so they are trying to always assess tax and if you don't deal with it properly up front in your expansion plans you can get caught because you may have to pay um large amounts of penalties interest and tax um a lot of countries have lower tax taxes than US but many countries do have higher taxes so depending on where you're going you have to worry about it
from an R&D perspective, you have to worry about the intellectual property. Where does that reside? Are you set up properly? Do you have the right advice to uh, to do research in Romania but own the uh, IP here in the U.S.? Or sometimes when you are expanding, uh, when you are, say, a British company that wants to migrate to the U.S. and become a U.S. company, you have issues around how do you migrate the IP from the U.K. to the U.S. And you see a lot of this happening in, for example, Israeli companies that are coming to the U.S. for either market opportunity or for investors and stuff. And they are always required to transfer their ownership of their IP to the U.S. entity, and, and that creates some cycles possibly taxation. And no matter what your footprint is in the foreign jurisdiction, you always have to worry about management support because without management support, that operation is going to fail. Somebody has to supervise those people. Somebody has to make sure they're on the right track. They're delivering to what the, what the plans were. So all of that plays into the, the strategy of your expansion. And then once you, once you again have decided a lot of those factors, uh, next slide please, uh, Joe. Uh, once you have decided on those factors, uh, and step one is you're going into an incorporation, uh, forming a subsidiary and incorporation, um, slide seven talks about all of the requirements that you have, for example, a registered office, a resident director. A resident director is becoming, is very common in, even in Western Europe, uh, European countries like Ireland uh, and, and, and those resident directors help you establish um, substance in your local entity. They're also required by law because that's the guy the government can go after to the extent there is something wrong with the company. So there's a lot of risk associated with being a resident director. Uh, obviously, they're part of your DNO, DNO insurance and things like that, but it can add up to be a pretty hefty fee. And, and Australia is a country that uh, implemented this just a few years ago, but Japan, on the other hand, uh, did away with the requirement of resident director from a legal perspective. But even today, when you go to open a bank account or open, uh, sign a lease or deal with a lot of uh, service providers and stuff, they're always looking for a resident director who holds the stamp, company stamp or the chop. And, and they want a resident director, even though legally it's not required. I talked a little bit about substance over form. So you need to have really local people and, and do some local operations to establish um, the form and show the local government that you're actually doing something there versus just structuring it for tax purposes. Obviously, data protection is a very important thing. No matter where you are, we hear it about it even in the today, the, the debates and stuff and things in the political environment. It is equally important in the business environment. Taxes, I talked about VAT, income, and possibly other taxes. At the end of the year, in most jurisdictions, beyond the income tax requirement is a statutory audit and an annual report requirement. And these are driven by the company law in that country. And you are required to have a statutory audit. You are required to final, file an annual report. Uh, and yes, there are penalties and consequences for not doing it. And if you are in the EU, because of the reach of the EU, you may not comply in France, but you may get stopped at the border in Germany because it is all connected internally there. And in, in certain cases, if you don't pay your VAT and things like that, you may end up getting a visit and they have the, the VAT authorities and they have the right to arrest you. Pretty serious business. Next please. Joe. So now that you have your, you figured out your operations, how you're going to set up and things like that. Now here are, here are the things that you need to worry about from an accounting and a payroll perspective. So you, first of all, you need a key filings calendar. So what are the deadlines? What is the VAT requirement? What is the tax requirement? What is the annual reporting requirements? When is payroll due? Because payroll is paid differently in different countries. Um, in UK, it's generally the last Thursday. Uh, in other countries, it may be the last working day. Uh, in, in countries like Italy, there is 14 paychecks that you get. 
So your $120,000 annual pay, you can just divide by 12 and pay $10,000 a month. You have to divide by 14 and pay accordingly. And the other two payments have to be managed in, in, in June and December. So there are other requirements that you need to have a full calendar. And then you need to make sure that that calendar ties into your payroll. Because a, a lot of what happens on day one is payroll, because some of those requirements may not kick in for, say, three, six, nine months, or possibly to the end of the year. Um, how are you going to consolidate those operations into your, into your uh, parent company books? So there is management, statutory accounting. So in countries like France, uh, the law governs how you account for things. Uh, the, the structure of your chart of account and things, which from a U.S. perspective you may care little about. So you need to figure out a way to make that statutory and management reporting work and U.S. gap work so that when you get a trial balance from France, it can actually consolidate and map into your U.S. trial balance and, and work through that. Obviously, there are uh, year-end issues because at the end of the year you have to report under the international standards uh, or the local interpretation of the international standards in that country. So you may have to keep two sets of books and how do you maintain control so the two books don't get out of sync uh, over time and you've got a big problem now. Talked about corporate and payroll taxes. Payroll taxes in different countries are due at different times. Um, and, and you have to make sure that you pay them on time. And this is where opening a local bank account is very important because uh, certain countries will not take, you cannot wire the payroll taxes to the government from a foreign bank account. In some countries, you, even locally, only certain banks are authorized to do that. So you have to be very careful as to where, you, where you're going and what local laws apply because you may get stuck in, in situations where, yes, you have a bank account, but you still cannot pay payroll taxes. In countries like Panama, you may actually have to walk over a check to the government office and creates logistics problems. Who's going to do that? Because your, guy, your team in, in Panama might be doing sales or marketing or R&D. Whose responsibility is it to go to the bank and deposit the, the taxes? Obviously, stock transactions, we're already used to it in the U.S., in foreign jurisdictions, people are getting very used to them also, but the taxability can be huge, immensely complicated again because depending on you know how you grant them, uh, RSUs versus stock options and things like that, taxability can be different. Is it at vesting? Is it at um, exercise? Uh, is it at the eventual sale? And at some point, you have to worry about accounts payable, accounts receivable. Now, accounts receivable, receivable may or may not apply depending on where you're selling from. So you might be selling from the U.S., and that's an acceptable model by having a cost plus entity in the, in, in the country. But uh, how, do you account, uh, how do you make sure that your AR is collected properly, timely, because you, again, are either relying on the local people to help with collections or you're having to build a team here in the U.S. or in your central headquarters to, to do the collections. Obviously, a lot of accounts payable is local. And the question becomes there is, how do you control the expenses? Do you put a PO system uh, or do you control it some other way? And visibility into what is being dispersed, where is the cash going? As you look at internationally, you have to worry about policies and processes and system expertise because in, in a particular country, like in France, you may have to keep your set of books in a locally compliant system. Your processes and policies may be customized to the local jurisdiction. So yes, a public company may have an ethics policy that everybody has to sign up to, but how do you make sure that it is properly enforced locally? versus some other policy that uh, vacation policy in the US you could have a vacation policy that says uh, all you can eat there is no restriction on taking time off but in most countries it is a contractual situation where you are agreeing that you're going to give them 30 days off a year plus bank holidays or whatever it is and they have a right if you agreed with them contractually they could take any amount of time off they may never show up to work so those are real challenges you face uh, and, and you would have no recourse. Next, please. So talking a little bit more about hiring and employment law, and obviously we're all used to at-will employment. 
we do this all the time in U.S. and we talk about it all the time. Uh, things like that don't exist outside of the country, you know, outside of U.S. Uh, in fact, a lot of countries have works council or collective bargaining agreements. And in fact, if you go to Nordic countries and you have more than one or two people, it is recommended to have a collective bargaining agreement with some union so you don't, because a lot of the benefits and compensation and things in each of these countries, some of these countries can be negotiated individually with each employee. Uh, it doesn't have to be consistent across all your employees. So by having a union or a collective bargaining agreement with some union, what you're doing is you're having to only negotiate with one party and it limits your overhead burden. Now that does create a different burden because you need local experts who can talk in the local language and talk to the unions and understand how they work. So they're not taking advantage of um, people that are going from the US as an example because they may or may not know everything that needs to be said or not said. Obviously, compensation and benefits are very important. You want to have the right plans from a compensation perspective, and, and you are subject to statutory benefits that are required in most countries, very socialistic environments, uh, versus supplemental benefits that you may or may not offer. Um, talked a little bit about stock options. You want to give options. Do the local employees see any value in it? Because if they are taxed up to 90% on the gain, they may see very little value in the stock options and you may have to structure a different form of compensation. To the extent you have expatriates, you have to worry about them because as you move them around, they're subject to tax in, in many jurisdictions and how do you manage that? Hiring, how do you hire? How do you find the right people in those jurisdictions? And obviously on contractors, you need to know the risk because that can, that can present tremendous amount of risk. So a little bit on India, China, and Brazil, just in terms of, next slide please, Joe. Uh, in terms of India, China, and Brazil, these are some of the most complicated jurisdictions to do business in, um, and, and most, com uh, most complicated jurisdictions to operate in. So even once you figure out some of the requirements and things like that, and this two sets of books, multiple resident director requirements, things like that. There's extensive rec ongoing requirements and things. Uh, and, and because the laws vary by country, but they also vary by province or state. So you get into a lot of complications in some of these countries and you have to be extremely careful uh, to operate properly. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe for the first polling question, Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Raghu. And indeed, this is the first of three polling questions we will intersperse throughout our webcast. What we want to find out from attendees is which is your top priority for your business during the next 12 months. What you're welcome to do is select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then to click on the submit button so we can record your response. From top to bottom, the choices are expanding by acquisition, expanding organically, expanding into a new market. In other words, it's not necessarily acquisition or uh, organically, but uh, a new market, perhaps a new category of product, for example. Uh, if there is another priority not listed above, you can select the radio button next to other. And if you don't know, that's fine. You are welcome to select the radio button next to I don't know. Now, after you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer, we do ask that you click on the submit button so we can record your response to the question which is your top priority for your business during the next 12 months. Again, to recap the choices from top to bottom, they are expanding by acquisition, expanding organically, expanding into a new market. If there is another uh, priority. You can select other. If you don't know, you can select the radio button next to I don't know. And again, we do ask that after you choose the radio button that corresponds to your answer, that you click on the submit button so we can record your response. What we will do is give you just a few more seconds, just a few more seconds to respond. And then what we will do is reveal how, we have, how you have responded, and then we will uh, turn our discussion over to uh, Raghu's fellow panelists. So, so far, what we can see is that, um, interestingly enough, 
a uh, plurality have indicated expanding organically, and then the net uh, plurality, nearly 40% or roughly 40% uh, expanding organically. Um, the next most prevalent response, interestingly, uh, roughly a fifth of respondents indicating uh, expanding into a new market. Now, before we continue our discussion, which will be with uh, Jessica Lee of Zillow, um, Raghu, this combination of responses, I'm just curious, this combination, does this correspond to what you have observed in your experience? Yeah, the the organic expansion is something that is very common, uh, commonly being seen in our client base, and um, um, what we're seeing is the next one is the expansion by acquisition. So I'm surprised that that is number three um, and tying with other, but um, the organic is is no doubt number one in our customer base client base. Thank you very much, Raghu, and thank you for setting the stage. We're now going to hear perspective from Jessica Lee, uh, Vice President and Corporate Controller with Zillow, and I would like everybody to give a warm welcome to Jessica Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, again, my name is Jessica Lee, and I'm with Zillow Group. Um, I also want to thank uh, CFO Publishing and Global Upside for the opportunity to be on the panel today. So I'm quickly going to go over... Um, basically the rising challenges that we have faced uh, specifically for the finance team and in laying the, gra the, the groundwork for that, I want to quickly go over kind of what our core mission is and our core values uh, to kind of play into how that plays into our, the DNA of our corporate culture. Um, so who we are, we can go ahead and advance this, yeah, so uh, this was in the introduction slide as well. We are the leading real estate company and marketplace dedicated to empowering consumers uh, with data, inspiration, and knowledge around the place they call home and connecting them with the best local professionals who can help. Our timeline, so we were again founded in 2005 and the website launched in early 2006. I actually joined the company in October of 06 and then we IPO'd in 2011 and since 2011 we've also had 12 acquisitions to date. So we have been fairly acquisitive um, really since the IPO. And our mission statement is to build a, the, the world's largest, most trusted and vibrant real estate marketplace. And how we do this really is driven by our core values as well. So as an organization, we focus on the following. Move fast, think big. Um, we like to take big swings um, and shoot from the hip and really uh, advance in those areas uh, by speed, creativity, and innovation. A train on the lights, we believe in transparency, unlocking information and making that useful for all. Uh, we also believe in Zillow Group is a team sport. Um, everyone has a role and working together, we can accomplish much more than we could ever as individuals and own it. You know, we own our outcomes, we act with humility and we're accountable and act with integrity. We trust and respect each other, have integrity, and really always thinking to do the right thing always. And finally, winning is fun. We are a very competitive group of folks, um, and we really seek to attract and retain and motivate the best people we can find. And we really focus on the long-term um, objective and executing well and winning. Uh, next slide, please. So again, these are some of the, the challenges, and then I'll kind of just talk about some tips um, kind of from, again, our perspective from a shared services and finance team. But again, I would say since I've been with the company, the, the key kind of uh, challenge we've been faced with is always keeping up with Zillow's incredibly fast-paced startup environment. Uh, we really focus on innovation, not just from, you know, the developers, but um, thinking about how we can innovate um, across the entire organization. So as an example, um, in the finance org, we developed a new products and revenue team that kind of spun out of the core accounting GL team. And the purpose is to collaborate with development teams, business leaders, sales operations teams early on because we found that it was very critical um, as they're planning and designing new products or changes to current products. Um, that we have a say in the, the billing, like in that process and mapping out what it's going to look like. It's going to affect the billing process, revenue recognition, reporting, and compliance requirements. Um, we, kind of early days, definitely had some experiences of kind of being the, the last ones to know about something rolling out, and that's never a good position to be in. So 
by designing this team, um, we've now partnered. Um, we're sitting at the table, and we have a voice, which is which is great. Um, another key challenge has been just again, as mentioned, um, having a dozen acquisitions just over the past basically five years um, has been very challenging. Uh, we had our largest acquisition to date was last year when we acquired Trulia. And just to give some perspective for folks. Uh, we had about, I think, 1,100 employees at the time. Um, Trulia also had about 1,000 employees, so we really were bringing together two companies of equal size, um, which had several challenges. Um, with having several acquisitions, again, some have been easier to integrate than others. Um, and a factor that stands out in um, integrating companies successfully is really to have um, a partnership with shared service teams and adhering to a roadmap. One of the things that we've done uh, with some of the larger acquisitions in particular is we have designated an internal project manager. Again, we developed this roadmap. Um, we divvy up the responsibilities across the impacted teams, and we've learned to definitely evaluate our resources early in the process. Um, this could be whether do we need to outsource to, you know, backfill for um, our current work staff, do we need to partner with um, potentially moving people off of teams to help specifically with the integration, but then again, how we backfill for the day-to-day -day tasks. Um, and again, just thinking about acquisitions in general, um, for those of you who have maybe not been through the process, you know, the, the, the diligence kind of pre-close is often a push to get a deal done by a certain time, and it's handled usually by a, a smaller group of indiv individuals across teams, and post-close, it's really our experience is that's when the shared services team in particular, um, you know, thinking about finance and IT, HR, legal facilities as an example, now really have to deal with the reality of integrating another company. And in our case, we move very quickly, so we want to get that integrated quickly. Um, that can be very daunting, especially depending on the size of the transaction and, again, how to balance regular day-to-day -day responsibilities um, during that integration process. Another challenge we've faced just because we've grown so quickly um, is just getting the support of the team and growing the team and getting that balance right. You know, who's, we want to find the right people for our team. And just to give some context, so when I started with the company back in 2006, uh, we had, by the end of 2006, I think we had three people in finance. Uh, we had 13 people in the finance the FTEs uh, at the time of the IPO. And now we have over 40 FTEs, and again, we have an outsourced team that we've had uh, with Global uh, since 2012. Uh, so for us, again, culture fit is really important, and it's just as important as finding someone with the right experience for a role. And so we really do take the time to not just look at somebody on paper, um, but hiring managers have been looking to meet with people even before they come in, for candidates to come in to do a full interview loop, because we don't want to waste people's time. We found that bringing people in sometimes that look great, maybe sounded great on a phone screen, you get them in the door and you know immediately they're not going to be a good fit. So keeping with that mindset of just moving fast and owning it and acting with integrity is, you know, do our due diligence even in hiring practices, um, meeting just in a one-on-one -on -one more casual environment and making sure that person is even worthy to bring in um, with the team. Um, but again, so yeah, finding the best talent, promoting from within has also been very important. Um, I'm happy to report we've had very low turnover um, in finance, which we're really proud of. And part of that's been just because we've had it, we've built this culture, we make sure we have fun, we work really hard, um, we schedule events and opportunities, and for recognition, which is really paramount in the, in the success of our team. Um, compliance is always a challenge. So, you know, going from a startup uh, company pre pre-IPO and then going into being a public company opens the company to a wide range of compliance issues to deal with. And for finance, I think most people think of SOX, but it's not just SOX. We use the IRS, the SEC, the PCOB, the DOL, other governing bodies, um, ta local tax, state and local tax authorities. And what we have found is, you know, oftentimes compliance means you need extra resources. So communicating to leadership early on. Um, why internal controls are important, change management, and why needing additional resources, whether that means a new system needs to get built or implemented or we need people, potentially outsourced, um, is really important but can be challenging. So one thing is that we've done is to make sure just we're prepared to back up you know, when we need to um, face an opportunity to communicate uh, often with the leadership team and also in different formats, sometimes email, is always good just to lay the framework, but sometimes uh, meeting face-to-face -face can be the most effective. 
And lastly, I think this is something we've constantly been challenged with really since the get-go is systems and operational processes. So I kind of note just like this duct tape approach and know when to peel off before it's too late. Really for us is, you know, our teams have had to deal with implementing new products, um, different companies, people, systems really from the beginning. And based on our mission, there's always been something new to incorporate into our systems and operational processes. And so along the way, we've had to duct tape systems and or processes together, knowing that they would be temporary. But since we've been growing at such a fast pace, it's been really hard to, to juggle with other priorities um, that can sometimes sideline your intention to fix what was actually meant to be a temporary fix. So some of the takeaways that we've had to do, uh, or how we've dealt with this is, again, using outsourced resources um, to help with some of those processes, especially some of the more manual processes. Um, but also taking a bit of a step back is making sure that finance has a voice and that your teams also know when to speak up when something is not working effectively or efficiently. And very important, again, is partnering with other teams such as the corporate applications team, IT, and fostering an environment to effectively manage and incorporate change, A, via systems, making operational improvements, um, again, outsourcing as an option and as ways to keep up with the organization. Um, one fun thing that we have done uh, before I jump to this next slide about why we outsource is just as a, we think about um, how our dev developers have Hack Week, and I always used to kind of think, well, why can't we have our own Hack Week? Um, so our developers have had Hack Weeks numerous times a year for several years, and so this past year we actually had, or in 2006, we had our first CFO Hack Week for the shared services teams, and it was really great to see the teams get together and really taking those core values about moving fast, thinking big, turning on the lights, um, and ways to continuing to innovate um, to help make things seamless for end users um, and growing with the company. So again, kind of jumping into the why we outsourced. Um, so again, we reached out basically in 2012, uh, realizing that we needed some assistance, and the focus was really to keep our internal team lean and balanced. Again, kind of getting that balance right. We didn't want to burn out our, our team members, um, and we, we recognized the fact that we needed some assistance, um, and really to streamline the detail-oriented and tedious tasks and processes that we had, again, moving really fast, kind of built these especially internal systems that were um, a bit of a, a bear to, to deal with. Um, and then also our ability to, to meet and manage our closed deadlines and, and also help with internal controls. Um, so again, again, we mentioned in late 2012, um, we had a, built our marketplace advertising program, Premier Agent, um, which we sell to local real estate agents, which was internally built. And so really our focus was to help on the, the reconciliation and tracking of those transactions. But as we continued to grow, we also looked for other areas of the businesses, not even just within finance, uh, that we could use outsourced help. Um, so we also teamed up with HR and our sales ops teams and introduced them to why outsourcing would be uh, potentially useful for them as well. And to think about kind of what we did is, as far as selecting our outsourced partner, um, I talked to our auditors, um, our VAR partner uh, for recommendations, and I probably had about six or so recommendations uh, for vendors to speak with. And during that process, I would say about half were too big for what for our needs, um, these were fairly large global outsourced partners in the industry, um, but then started to narrow down on vendors that would be more suitable for, for our needs and what we were looking for. So we did our cost analysis, spoke with references, really targeted our references um, to try to speak with li other like-minded companies who were also growing quickly. And we also were very direct with, uh, which I'm sure Ray you can attest to, we were very direct um, with our conversations um, regarding how our outsourced partners would need to rise to the challenges faced by our internal teams as well. So for us, we did decide to work with Global Upside, and it really came down to Global uh, being most in line with our core values, and while outsourced as a team, they would still be an extension of our team. Moving to the next slide. Okay, so onboarding support, or outsourced support and onboarding the team, some key takeaways. Document business, uh, business processes or any processes. This was definitely a lesson learned. Um, 
in some cases where we did not have some things documented very well, and so there was a lot of back and forth um, with our outsourced team members, and it was a little bit, um, just it ate up some time that could have been more value add had we built those processes up front. Uh, so definitely recommend having anything documented in, in prior to a transition or working with an outsourced partner. Um, having in-person training, that was really uh, great for us to have and for Global to accommodate, uh, to come in on site, meet with our team, and then be able to transfer that knowledge back to their team um, in India and, and off site. And then security, kind of just another thing that we needed to think about was, you know, how are we going to share information, uh, making sure that we had proper security rights um, with regards to, you know, individual login accounts, access to files, and et cetera. And then as we've monitored um, and uh, the work going forward performed, you know, kind of looking at what's changed and so evaluating processes, systems, team structure, as kind of I've mentioned, we've had a lot of growth in the last five years. And so constantly kind of revisiting those. We typically shoot to have quarterly reviews um, to go over not only kind of what's changed, but cost, hours, projects, what else could be, um, it's kind of like low hanging fruit that could be um, helped with as well. And then again, you know, kind of in closing, really be thinking about how our outsource su support can help other teams, maybe even outside of your own department. So talking to your peers, um, other shared services teams, other departments, internal stakeholders. Um, as mentioned, we've, we've used outsource support for HR, for sales ops, um, but we're always trying to be a, a good ear um, to see what other needs people and challenges people are dealing with um, as well and to see how outsource, outsource support could help them. And with that, I will turn it back to Joe. Thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing Zillow's experience. And what we're now going to do before we hear from uh, Rich, uh, uh, our next uh, panelist, is we're going to pose a second of three polling questions. Our second polling question asks, from which region or regions are most of your uh, foreign sales. Um, so uh, every uh, every industry has its terminology. So uh, uh, Asia Pacific region uh, is often considered one uh, overall uh, region. Um, that said, um, so what we're going to do is uh, indicate the choices. Uh, I would note that you are welcome to select the radio button that corresponds to your answer, and then click on the submit button so we can record your response. And from top to bottom, the choices are um, Asia Pacific region, uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, and or Asia, not necessarily with Asia, not necessarily overlapping with the Asia Pacific region. Um, Latin America, um, if there is another realm of America, say Canada, uh, that's not part of Latin America, you can select the radio button next to choice D. Um, if there is another region not listed above, you're welcome to select the radio button next to choice E. If you don't know, that's fine. You can select the radio button next to choice F. And if this question is not applicable, if you're not, uh, if you don't have uh, foreign sales, you can select the radio button next to choice G. Indeed, you can feel free to select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then to click on the submit button. So we can record your response to the question from which region or regions are most of your foreign sales. Again, to recap, from top to bottom, Asia Pacific region, Europe, Middle East, and or Asia, uh, Latin America, Americas other than Latin America, uh, other if you don't know, that's fine. You can select that choice, and if the question is not applicable, you can indicate not applicable. And uh, again, we ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer, and then click on the submit button so we can record your response. What we will do is give you just a few more seconds to respond. We'll summarize your responses, and then we'll turn it over to Rich. And so far, what we can see is that among uh, attendees of this webcast or respondents uh, who have responded, um, of those for whom this question is indeed applicable, um, it does appear Europe, uh, Europe, Middle East, and or Asia, again, not necessarily the Asia-Pacific region, that is accounting for about a third of respondents. And then the next most prevalent response is America's other than Latin America, roughly 18%. Uh, of respondents, again, corresponding to those for whom this question is indeed applicable. Well, at this stage, it is now my pleasure to turn it over to our next panelist, uh, Rich Harrison, CFO of Glaucos. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and, and thanks to CFO.com and to uh, Global Upside, our partner, uh, for inviting me to present to you. So. Um, my case study will, will maybe be most uh, interesting to those of you who um, are expanding into the international markets primarily for distribution rather than manufacturing or design or development. 
uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, Glaucos is a medical device company. We're in the ophthalmology space, and we're, re we're focused on glaucoma. We will look at some other uh, eye diseases, but we're primarily focused on glaucoma. Um, it's a horrible disease. Uh, it's often undiagnosed, uh, or when it's diagnosed, it's often too late. The damage has been done. The damage is irreversible, but the progression of glaucoma can be slowed or halted with the proper treatment. And most of the treatments are focused on reducing intraocular pressure. Uh, the pressure caused by the manufacture of a liquid called aqueous humor flows into the front portion called the anterior chamber of the eye to nourish the cornea, which doesn't have a blood supply. So the aqueous humor is nourishing the, the, the cornea. Um, if that liquid doesn't drain out at the same rate it's produced, it builds up pressure, and that pressure will allow glaucoma to continue to progress. So all of the treatments for glaucoma are aimed at reducing intraocular pressure. Most of the population of, of glaucoma in the U.S. or, or, or around the world um, falls into the, the, mod, uh, the mild to moderate glaucoma. The late stages of glaucoma are a small portion of the glaucoma population. But the uh, surgical treatments have been uh, relegated just to the late stages of glaucoma because they're so invasive uh, and they throw off so many side effects. So uh, there have been no uh, real good solutions for treating glaucoma other than drops. It drops for mild to moderate. And drops have issues um, uh, with compliance. These are elderly patients who are taking multiple drops a day. They have difficulty remembering to take their drops or getting them in the right place. So uh, the, 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 the disease progresses and um, um, they continue to have more glaucomatous damage. So we have created a, a category called MIGS, Microinvasive Glaucoma Surgery. We are the first uh, product that is approved for a surgical treatment of mild to moderate glaucoma. It's called the eye stent. We believe it's the smallest implant ever made uh, for implantation in the human body, and you can see a depiction of it on the, on the uh, uh, head of a penny. So we got approval from the FDA in 2012. Uh, you can see our net sales. We've had rapid growth, and most recently our growth is up uh, almost 60% year-to-date through June. Uh, because of our performance, we were able to have a stellar IPO in June of 2015. We're traded on the New York Stock Exchange under Glaucos. When I joined the company, we had about, I think I was employee 32, and we now have over 200 employees worldwide. In, um, if, if we look at this year and just kind of give a status on our international, net sales are representing uh, OUS about 8% of our total sales. Um, we have a target of getting to 15% uh, of sales in, in the near term. And uh, what we, uh, a lot of companies do is when they first uh, go into the OUS markets and they want to distribute their products, they'll, they'll uh, sign distribution agreements with stocking distributorships. The problem with those distributorships is they're often representing multiple lines, different products. For instance, our distributors would not only sell our products, but they would sell intraocular lenses and um, tr uh, what they call FACO systems, which are systems used to do um, um, uh, treatments of cataracts, and uh, they, we have a hard time getting them to focus on our products. So uh, in Germany in 2013, we realized we had just gotten a very strong regulatory approval and reimbursement codes, uh, and it was a large target market, So we and our distributor was not performing well. So we decided we were going to use that as a pilot opportunity to go direct uh, with direct sales. So we created uh, Glaucos Europe, which is now called Glaucos Germany, GmbH, late in 2013. We launched our products in, at the end of the first quarter of 2014. Um, it's a wholly owned uh, uh, subsidiary. It's a distribution company. Um, at, uh, we, uh, we worked to find local legal counsel. There was a lot of work. We uh, uh, searched for a local accounting firm to do accounting and payroll. We started with three sales reps, and uh, the, the success of, of that pilot was, uh, was very evident quickly on. We had extremely uh, rapid growth in that territory. Um, and so uh, we uh, decided that uh, because of that, we were uh, and, our, and our sales growth target to get to 15% of our total sales coming from international markets, um, we realized that we were going to continue this strategy. And... Um, in middle of 2015, before we learned about uh, global upside, we uh, we did the same uh, the same model. We went to Japan, and uh, I was there talking to accounting firms and, and law firms, et cetera. Um, and, and it was it was it was quite a lot of work. Um, 
And uh, um, then once we uh, did our IPO and we had additional uh, funding available, uh, we made a strategic decision that we were going to substantially uh, accelerate our uh, creation of these um, distribution subsidiaries in a number of countries. And as you can see, in January, uh, we expanded into Australia and Canada. Um, in uh, the middle of 2016, we have opened up subsidiaries in the UK, Spain, Sweden, and France. And um, toward the middle of last year, after our experience in Japan, we realized that it was going to be very difficult for us to continue to do this and spend the time and, and resources and get the quality and consistent quality across the platform by going into all these countries and doing it ourselves. So we kind of um, we kind of lucked into finding um, we kind of lucked into finding Global Upside. We were searching for an international payroll provider. We identified one called ADP Streamline. ADP Streamline introduced us to Global Upside, and, and I'll tell you that I was uh, had not had experience with global outsourcing of these kinds of services, and I was a bit of a doubting Thomas at first. So we decided to uh, hire Global Upside to help us uh, in our Australia and Canada launches. And what I uh, quickly learned is that they um, uh, were, were a, great, um, a great partner for us um, because of all the reasons that Raghu pointed out in his presentation. Um, for us to continue down the path of independently identifying uh, local accounting firms, et cetera, um, we were going to have a, a real disparate set of systems and, and, and accounting systems and payroll um, that were different in every location and trying to have consistent quality of information uh, and pulling all that together into consolidation was going to be uh, extremely challenging. Um, once we, I'm going to go back one slide, you know, once we um, had our good experience with Global Upside in Australia and Canada, we've now um, assigned additional statements of work for them to work with us on the UK, Spain, Sweden, and France, and we are adding more. Uh, more are coming. I can't tell you where they're going to be, but uh, we're adding more uh, later this year. So um, I guess I'll close with, um, you know, uh, it, to, to me it's, it's, it's proven itself as, as a great model. Um, I think you should find a partner who, uh, like Global Upside, uh, can, can demonstrate that they have a broad range of countries and, and continents where they have operations and experience. You know, the key to, to Global Upside is they don't try to be the final expert in every country in which they're providing the basic accounting services, but they've identified uh, local providers, uh, both on the legal side and the accounting side, um, who uh, perform uh, advice and uh, perform the year-end compliance kind of things, the tax filings, the, the, the VAT filings, um, uh, tax returns, et cetera, and any other compliance things. So, you know, when you're looking for a partner, explore what they have, explore their systems, uh, explore what kind of ERP system they're going to use. Um, we are going to be converting now from QuickBooks in these countries, and we're actually uh, going to be uh, empowering Global Upside to use our own ERP system, which is which is a small firm, a small uh, system called Expandable, to do all the transaction processing in General Ledger. And then while you're doing it, uh, take the same focus on the same focus on banks and payroll and compliance. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, unless you're a very large multinational company, if you're if you're something along the lines of, of Glauco size or smaller, um, try to find one bank that you can use in all these countries, uh, one payroll system uh, like we use with ADP, Streamline, one accounting service, and one legal compliance leader, which uh, we selected Global Upside uh, to do for us. So uh, thanks, thank you very much, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Joe. Well, thank you very much, Rich. And what we're now going to do is pose a third of three polling questions. Before we pose our question, I do want to remind attendees you're welcome to uh, pose your questions in the Q&A text area. That's immediately below the link to uh, download slides. And we'll try to uh, set aside some time after the poll to addressing any questions that we receive. Um, our third and final polling question, however, is the following. What is your primary motivation for outsourcing? You're welcome to select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the Submit button so we can record your response from top to bottom. The choices are solve capacity issues, global scalability, 
have access to experience and expertise throughout a broad range of countries. If there is another motivation not listed above, you can select other. If you don't know, that's fine. You can select the radio button next to I don't know. And if your organization doesn't currently outsource, you can select the radio button next to the bottom choice. Now, after you choose the radio button that corresponds to your answer, we do ask that you click on the Submit button so we can record your response to the question, what is your primary motivation for outsourcing? And just to give you enough time to respond, I'll recap the choices from top to bottom. Solve capacity issues, global scalability, have access to experience and expertise throughout a broad range of countries. Other, I don't know, or if you don't outsource, you can select the radio button next to the bottom choice. Again, after you choose the radio button that corresponds to your answer, we do ask that you click on the Submit button so we can record your response. And what we can see is that among respondents, among respondents, uh, those of you who are outsourcing, the uh, two leading responses are um, roughly a fifth of respondents, indeed, for each, uh, solve capacity issues and have access to experience and expertise throughout a broad range of countries. Um, and I think that's quite intriguing. What we now want to do is address some great, great questions that we have received um, from attendees. And so uh, the question that we've received from one attendee um, is, uh, on, a, on a global level, um, uh, controllership, um, you know, how, to, how does one manage that? I think what we also want to do is kind of a follow-up question to this is, um, and, and perhaps this is a related question, and I'll direct this perhaps to each member of our panel. For I think this will be our one question, and I'll direct it to each member of our panel. Um, the follow-up question being, how do we make sure that our headquarters maintains control, proper reporting uh, across uh, multiple countries? Perhaps we'll start first with Raghu, then Jessica, and then Rich. So starting first with Raghu, how would you respond to this question? So maintaining control, as I had mentioned uh, in my deck, is extremely important from a central headquarter perspective because you don't want to lose control of sending cash every month and not knowing where it is going. And so whether you allow access to your service providers to input information directly into your ERP system where you can gain visibility or otherwise set up, uh, set up different processes, reporting processes to get relevant information on a periodic basis, weekly, biweekly, monthly, that kind of stuff, so that you have visibility into why, are, why is cash being requ requested, where is it going, um, and, and what all activities are happening. So, so there is the cash aspect of, uh, or accounting aspect of life, and there's obviously a productivity aspect from, say, a sales perspective or an R&D perspective. And to the extent you tie the two up and you say, yes, if you're selling a million dollars in, in Germany, are we getting a million dollars of cash and why are we having to fund that much if our costs are only, say, half a million dollars? What is wrong? And so uh, applying some analytical tools uh, and, and relying on some good reporting structures and things like that can help you manage that. Thank you very much, Raghu. Very briefly, uh, Jessica, and then, Rich, how would you respond uh, to this uh, same question about uh, uh, ensuring a headquarters maintains control, proper reporting across multiple countries? Uh, yeah, I would say for us, we actually have not had to deal with this um, to date. We're, we're only in the United States, um, but if we were posed with this position, we do have a small dev shop um, just in Vancouver, BC, um, but again, there's no real controls as far as um, finance um, or accounting policies that they're having to, or transactions that they're having to monitor. But I would agree with uh, Regu and just really think about um, the access and the types of portals, whether it be banking portals or ERP portals and access and by, um, by which people would have um, access to and then setting up processes. And I would also probably recommend having kind of set deliverables um, to and from kind of the headquarters or the controllership um, team with those other offices to make sure that, you know, if something does go sideways, people have um, a way by which to react and um, hopefully get in front of things before, before it's too late. Um, but yeah, I would set up deliverables and just have a, a good process set up by which um, all parties can, can communicate back and forth and make sure they're getting what they need to be getting. Thank you, Jessica. Finally, Rich, very briefly, how would you respond to the same question? 
Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's all about consistency and putting in um, consistency across different different programs and platforms. That, that's why I mentioned earlier trying to get one bank that has presence in all the different countries or most of the countries you're going to be in, so you can use their online banking uh, portal and. You know, the same thing with, with just selecting an outsourcing firm so that, and using your own ERP system so you can get everybody on the same calendar, the same processes, and, and have visibility and transparency uh, to, the, to all the data that's coming in. And then after that, it, it's a matter of invoking discipline and, and making sure everyone is, uh, is meeting your time schedules. Thank you very much, Rich and Jessica and Ragu. I'm Joe Fleischer, moderator of our webcast. On behalf of our very distinguished guests, Jessica Lee, Vice President and Corporate Controller with Zillow, Rich Harrison, CFO of Glaucos, and Raghu Bargava, Co-Founder and CEO of Global Upside. We all very much appreciate your joining our webcast. Always on growth, finance and HR challenges that can trip you up at home and beyond. Brought to you by CFO Publishing and by the sponsor of our webcast, Global Upside. We thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.